ere the half hour ended. Five o'clock struck. School was dismissed and all were gone in to the refectory to tea. It was deep dusk. I retired into a corner and sat down on the floor. The spell by which I had been so far supported began to dissolve. Reaction took place. And soon, so overwhelming was the grief that seized me that I sank prostrate with my face to the ground. Now I wept. I had meant to be so good and to do so much at Lowood, to make so many friends, to earn respect and win affection. Already I had made visible progress. That very morning I had reached the head of my class. Miss Miller had praised me warmly. Miss Temple had smiled appreciatively. She had promised to teach me drawing and to even let me learn French. I was also well received by my fellow pupils and treated as an equal by those of my own age. Now, here I lay, again crushed and trodden on. Could I ever rise more? Never. Come, eat something. I put both away. Feeling as if a drop or a crumb would choke me, I continued to weep aloud. Helen sat down on the ground near me, embraced her knees with her arms, and rested her head upon them, and sat silently. I was the first who spoke. Helen, why do you stay with a girl whom everybody believes to be a liar? Everybody, Jane? Why? There are only 80 people who have heard you called so, and the world contains hundreds of millions. But what have I to do with millions? The 80 I know despise me. Jane, you are mistaken. Probably not one in the school either despises or dislikes you. Many, I'm sure, pity you much. How can they pity me after what Mr. Brocklehurst has said? Mr. Brocklehurst is not even liked here. Had he treated you as a special favorite, you would have found enemies, declared or covert, all around you. As it is, the greater number would offer you sympathy if they dared. Teachers and pupils may look coldly at you for a day or two, but friendly feelings are concealed in their hearts. And if you persevere in doing well, these feelings will ere long appear much more evidently, especially after their temporary suppression. Besides, Jane... Well, Helen? If the entire world hated you and believed you to be wicked, while your own conscience approved you and absolved you from guilt, you would not be without friends. No, I know I should think well of myself, but that is not enough. If others do not love me, I would rather die than live. I cannot bear to be solitary and hated. To gain some real affection from you or Miss Temple or any other whom I truly love, I would willingly submit to have the bone of my arm broken or to let a bull toss me or... Hush, Jane. You think too much. I know you are innocent of this charge, which Mr. Brocklehurst has weakly and pompously repeated at second hand from Mrs. Reed, for I read sincerity in your eyes. I came on purpose to find you, Jane Eyre. I want you in my room, and as Helen Burns is with you, she may too. We follow the superintendent's guidance and cross some intricate passages before we reached her apartment. It contained a good fire and looked cheerful. Miss Temple told Helen Burns to be seated in a low armchair on one side of the hearth and herself taking another. She called me to her side. Is it all over? Have you cried your grief away? I'm afraid. I never shall do that. Why? Because I have been wrongly accused, and you, ma'am, 
and everybody else will now think me wicked. We shall think you what you prove yourself to be, my child. Continue to act as a good girl and you will satisfy us. Shall I, Miss Temple? You will. Now, tell me, who is the lady whom Mr. Brocklehurst called your benefactress? Mrs. Reed, my uncle's wife. My uncle is dead and he left me to her care. Did she not then adopt you of her own accord? No, ma'am. She was sorry to have to do it. I have often heard that my uncle got her to promise before he died that she would always keep me. Well, Jane, when a criminal is accused, he is always allowed to speak in his own defense. You have been charged with falsehood. Defend yourself to me as well as you can. Say whatever your memory suggests is true, but add nothing and exaggerate nothing. I resolved in the depth of my heart that I would be moderate, most correct. Having reflected a few minutes to arrange coherently what I had to say, I told her the story of my sad childhood. Exhausted by emotion, my language was more subdued than it generally was when it developed sad theme. And mindful of Helen's warning against the indulgence of resentment, I infused into the narrative far less of gall and wormwood than ordinary. I felt as I went on that Miss Temple fully believed me. In the course of the tale, I had mentioned Mr. Lloyd, as having come to see me after the fit, for I never forgot the frightful episode of the Red Room, when Mrs. Reed had locked me in the dark and haunted chamber. After I finished, Miss Temple regarded me for a few minutes. I know something of Mr. Lloyd. I shall write to him. If his reply agrees with your statement, you shall be publicly cleared from every imputation. To me, Jane, you are clear now. How are you tonight, Helen? Have you coughed much today? Not quite so much, I think, ma'am. And the pain in your chest? It is a little better. But you too are my visitors tonight. I must treat you as such. Miss Temple asked Barbara to get tea for all of us. Soon Barbara came in with a tray. How fragrant the steam of the beverage was and the scent of the toast. However, to my dismay, for I was beginning to feel hungry, I discerned only a very small portion. Miss Temple discerned it too. Fortunately, I have it in my power to supply deficiencies for this once. Having invited Helen and me to approach the table and placing before each of us a cup of tea with one delicious but thin morsel of toast, Miss Temple took out a good-sized seed cake and proceeded to cut generous slices. We satisfied our famished appetites on the delicate fare she liberally supplied. After tea was over and the tray had been removed, Miss Temple again summoned us to the fire. We sat on each side of her and now a conversation followed between her and Helen. It was indeed a privilege to be admitted to hear such a conversation. They conversed of things I had never heard of, what stores of knowledge they possessed. When the bell announced bedtime, Miss Temple embraced us both, saying as she drew us to her heart, God bless you, my children. About a week after this, Miss Temple, who had written to Mr. Lloyd, received his answer. Miss Temple, having assembled the whole school, announced that an inquiry had been made into the charges alleged against me and that she was most happy to be able to pronounce me completely cleared from every charge. 
The teachers then shook hands with me and kissed me, and a murmur of pleasure ran through the ranks of my companion. Thus relieved of a grievous load, I, from that hour, set to work afresh. I toiled hard and my success was proportionate to my efforts. In a few weeks, I was promoted to a higher class. That night, on going to bed, I forgot to prepare in imagination the barmicide supper of hot roast potatoes or white bread and fresh milk, with which I was wont to amuse my inward cravings. Instead, I feasted on the spectacle of freely penciled houses and trees and picturesque rocks and ruins and examined in thought the possibility of translating the French story which Madame Piero had shown me that day. I would not now have exchanged Lowood with all its privations for Gateshead and its daily luxuries.